Okay. So last time we were talking about uh, the first of these uh, three topics that we're going to cover in this module. Uh, we talked about how we can pattern materials using light. Can everyone see? So we talked about different photolithography techniques. So today we're going to get into uh, micromachining. Um, how can you transfer uh, a photoresist pattern onto um, a typical like uh, material that we want to make a device out of? For example, uh, common materials used in microfabrication are um, uh, silicon, uh, glass, uh, metals, various metals. Okay. Uh, so these, these are common materials that we can make uh, microfluidic devices and sensor devices out of. So we'll talk about uh, some of the materials and we'll also talk about some of the machining techniques. Uh, today I also hope to get into soft lithography and micromolding. So that category of materials are materials like plastics. Okay, we talked about last time that uh, um, the reason we may want to use plastics instead of these traditional micromachining materials like silicon and glass is that plastics are a lot cheaper. You can make uh, uh, devices out of plastics for maybe 10 cents, uh, 10 cents a piece, maybe even less than that. Okay, so obviously, like uh, being able to fabricate things with plastics is very important in microfluidic devices, where you're going to be disposing, uh, where you're going to make disposable devices. So the basic concept of micromachining is this: um, you have a photoresist pattern. Oh, shock. You have a, a photoresist micro pattern, and you want to transfer that pattern to a layer underneath it. So what you would do is you'd create uh, a photoresist pattern first using uh, lithography, what we talked about in class last time, and then you can use a variety of uh, etching techniques to transfer that uh, transfer that uh, pattern into the material under it. Uh, this is an example of what's called surface micromachining. Okay, so the idea here is that you'd lay down, uh, you deposit a thin film of material, let's say like uh, a metal, let's say a metal layer. Okay. Um, yeah. Then you deposit the photoresist on top of that. You pattern the photoresist and then you etch, uh, then you etch the metal. So I don't think I have a schematic of that here. So let me just show a quick example of that. Uh, just a quick example of wet. Uh, wet machining. Right, so the simple uh, concept of um, micromachining is this. So this would be surface micromachining. You have a, a substrate. And so we'd like to make an object by building it layer by layer. So let's say we deposit a layer of um, we deposit a layer of metal on top. Let's say we want to make uh, a gold electrode. Okay, so from the top view, it might look like this. We want to make a gold electrode sitting on the surface of um, uh, a wafer here, like this. Okay, and this is gold metal, uh, pattern sitting on top of a silicon uh, wafer. So what you do is for, you first start off with your silicon, which is your substrate. Okay, so this is S, SI. Deposit a layer of gold on it using a few different techniques, which we'll talk about in the next few slides. Then you deposit photoresist on top. Um, photoresist will go on like this. So you deposit a layer here. Like so. So this is photoresist. And then uh, we talked about how to lithographically define photoresist. Okay, so in the areas, for example, if you're using a positive photoresist, the areas that were exposed by ultraviolet light. Um, so let's say this is, uh, let's say your light is coming in just in this region here, and the rest of it is masked off. So your mask looks something like this. So then this region of the photoresist becomes exposed. And then when you develop it, it goes away. Right, so then you're left with a photoresist, photoresist pattern that looks like this. So, okay. Get rid of your mask here. 
Now, the next step is to transfer that pattern that's on the photoresist to the uh, gold layer underneath it. So what we can do now is we can take this whole thing and dip it into uh, a layer of, if we want to do wet etching, we can dip it into a chemical called a gold etchant. Okay. And uh, when we dip it in that bath, so let's say we have it underneath, we dip this whole thing into a bath full of uh, gold etchant. So the gold etchant will go in here, it'll start etching away the gold, and we time the etching so that we remove just this section of the gold. Okay, so we'll get rid of this, uh, and we'll end up with, oh, what's going on here? So we'll end up with just the gold layer like this. Now if we over etch, the gold etching might actually get underneath the photoresist, and that's called undercut. We have to be careful that we don't undercut the materials. Usually we just etch for just a, a minute or so, so that that gives enough time for the etchant to go through the photoresist and etch the material underneath it. After we're done with this step, we remove the photoresist, right? So it looks like this, okay? And then we're left with the pattern gold layer. So each, now we've patterned one layer. Now we can deposit a second layer and pattern that layer, deposit a third layer and pattern that layer. So by doing this step-by-step, a process we can build up uh, complex devices. So that's the idea of uh, micromachining. All right, so I also discussed how we would um, uh, res strip the photoresist. So one step is you're developing the photoresist. You're only removing the areas that were exposed by light. And then after you do the etching, you remove all the photoresist. So that's called photoresist stripping. You use a different chemical, and that chemical it will remove all photoresist regardless of whether it has been exposed or not. So wet etching uses acid, acids and bases to selectively remove material. You can also use something called dry etching, where, uh, where a gas or a plasma is used to selectively remove the material. And you'll always have some sort of mask, whether it's made of photoresist or some other material. Uh, the mask is what, uh, uh, well, the mask is used in, in two senses, okay? The uh, one type of mask we talked about when we were doing photolithography. That's the mask where you shine the light through there. There are regions of the mask that are opaque. And some regions are transparent. Now, when we talk about a mask in etching, the photoresist layer covering the wafer is also referred to as a mask. Okay, so that's protecting certain areas from being etched. So those, that term mask is used interchangeably. Now, this is a, a diagram that shows surface versus bulk micromachining. Now, when we're talking about bulk micromachining, we're removing large sections of the wafer. And typically, the wafer is made out of uh, silicon, and then this is a subtractive process. For example, if we were going to drill a large hole or use a process called deep RIE to, uh, to basically remove a large amount of uh, the wafer itself or the substrate, that's referred to as bulk micromachining. So this is what a subtractive process, meaning we're, we're starting off with the material and we're removing some of that material to get our structure. So in this case, the structure would be just a large hole. When we're talking about surface micromachining, that's an additive process. And that was a process that I just talked about, where you, you will deposit a thin layer of material, pattern that layer of material, and then deposit another layer of material, pattern that layer of material, and so on. So that process continues. That's what's called an additive process. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, different machining techniques applying to both of these uh, uh, philosophical approaches, a subtractive and additive process. So this slide is about silicon wet etching. <clears throat> so there are a few different uh, chemicals that we can use to selectively remove parts of silicon. Okay, uh, when you, uh, you know, when you guys do your, uh, uh, your term projects, um, part of your term projects, you're going to uh, be asked to figure out, you know, the physics of it, how, you know, maybe you'll be asked to do a simulation of how your device works. You'll also be asked to uh, tell me how you can fabricate the device. I assume, like, that most of the research projects will be about making some sort of biomems device. So the context for like how this uh, module fits into your, your class projects is I, I, I want you to understand the different fabrication processes so that you know if you want to work with a certain material, what are the fabrication processes associated with that material, and just, to, just so you have a background uh, in this area. 
So if, you're, if your device happens to be made out of silicon, there are a few techniques we'll talk about how to work with silicon. Uh, so getting back to the slide then, uh, there are two chemicals that etch uh, silicon that are you know, uh, used quite often. Uh, one is called an isotropic etchant, the other one is called an anisotropic etchant. Does anyone know what those terms mean? What, what does isotropic mean? All well, you mechanical engineers. You know what isotropic means? Sorry? Nope. Isotropic. Tropic means like with directions? Yeah, for good. Okay. When we're talking about heat flow, isotropic means we're talking about a uniform distribution of, of heat flow. It means heat's flowing equally in all directions. Yeah, yeah exactly. So when we're, when we're talking about chemical etching, isotropic etching means that it's equal in all directions. Okay, there's no selectivity to a certain crystal plane of the wafer. Okay, so the chemical etchant, isotropic etchant will, um, if you dip silicon wafer in an isotropic etchant and you have a mask on top of it, it will etch uniformly in all directions. Okay, it has no selectivity towards the crystal planes of the wafer. So you'll end up with um, these uh, uh, kind of like a circular patterns. Okay, depending on how long you etch, these holes will grow larger and larger, and, and eventually you'll etch through the entire wafer. Right. So if you want to make um, like semicircular uh, rounded channels, then you can use an isotropic uh, etching technique. So some examples. This is uh, uh, HNO3, a uh, mixture of HNO3 and HF isotropically etches silicon at a rate of 50 microns per minute. A typical silicon wafer is 500 microns thick, so it's only 10 minutes to get through the entire wafer. So you do have to time these things properly. If you etch too long or you etch too, uh, too little, you won't get the right size hole. So one of the, one of the tricky things with isotropic etching or, uh, is uh, that uh, you have to time the etch perfectly. For example, if you're trying to make a microfluidic channel with depth 100 microns, you have to time it exactly or you have to very well can characterize process. Um, there are ways that we can kind of get around this. We'll talk about that later. When you do isotropic etching, you have to um, have obviously have a material that's not attacked by the etchant. So uh, when we're working with silicon, typical materials that we'll use to um, mask the etch is silicon dioxide, uh, CVD oxide, different types of metals like chrome or gold or silicon nitride. And these materials are all, are all well understood. This allows you to make rounded channels in, in silicon. And we have uh, anisotropic etching over here. Anisotropic means that the etch direction depends on which depends on the orientation of the crystal. So certain planes in in the silicon uh, uh, in the silicon wafer will not etch as quickly as some of the other planes. Now let me just um, so uh, silicon if you imagine the, the crystal uh, structure of silicon I'm not going to draw where all the atoms are but um, let's say this is the silicon wafer. Okay, it's circular, it's about 500 microns thick. Most silicon wafers have the 100 plane exposed. What that means is that this surface of the wafer is according to this surface of the crystal plane. That surface of the crystal plane has a certain atomic distribution. Okay. Uh, there's another crystal um, plane, which we call the 100 plane, and that would be um, this plane over here. It's the plane that goes across the wafer like this. That's the 100 plane. Turns out that the chemical etchant etches at a different rate along the, the 110 uh, plane as the 100 plane. And there's a third crystal plane, which is the 110 plane, which, which is if we were to create a plane oops, like this. 
so you can see that that triangle over there. So this is the one 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 plane. The red one is the uh, one one zero plane, and the blue one is representing the one zero zero plane. All right. The different etchants actually uh, this etchant KOH etches diff uh, at different rates. Uh, in the 100 plane versus the 111 plane. I, I, I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. The, it etches the 100 plane and the 110 planes at the same rate, but it doesn't etch on the 111 plane. So what's interesting is that instead of forming these nice rounded structures where the etching is etching uh, uniformly in every different direction, uh, you, you'll get these uh, anisotropic patterns, very well-defined patterns, because the etchant gets to a 1, 1, 1 plane and it stops etching at that point. So some of these etches, they actually self-terminate. Um, for example, if you were to have a, um, a mask that looks like this, your mask opening is here, and then you uh, drop this into uh, uh, KOH, KOH will see a 100 plane, the surface of this wafer is a 100 plane, so it'll start etching downwards. Okay, but once it starts seeing this 111 plane, the 111 plane goes sort of at an angle through the wafer. It can't etch this 111 plane, but it can etch the 100 plane. So what will happen is that this edge will come down, but you'll start for seeing these 110, you'll start exposing these 111 planes. All right, so these uh, walls form a specific angle, 57 degrees, uh, that, um, that won't etch. And so you can make some very well-defined structures this way. Uh, if the size of your mask, if the size of your mask opening is small enough, uh, you end up getting a triangular pattern because this 111 plane meets this 111 plane and they terminate at a point. So you can create these pyramidal structures like this, very, very well defined with very, very sharp corners. And uh, 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 these are actually used as little molds to make uh, tips. If you deposit metal into one of these pits, the, the tip of the metal will be very, very sharp. So uh, you can actually leverage this uh, uh, anisotropic etching phenomena. So it's a little bit about uh, silicon wet etching. Now, there's also dry etching. Now, dry etching, I would say, is used more often, especially in the semiconductor industry, um, because there's less uh, harmful chemicals involved. Right? KOH and uh, the other uh, material, the acid etching, isotropic etching. I mean, th these are harsh chemicals. They're sort of, you know, difficult to work with, in the sense that you need to you need to have um, proper ventilation, you need to have proper protection. Um, in addition, turns out that a wet etching techniques, it's, it's more difficult to get really tiny features when you're working with wet etching, etching techniques. So dry etching has become quite popular. Now dry etching uses uh, a technique called reactive ion etching, or RIE for short. So in RIE, uh, an RF plasma accelerates these uh, ions towards the substrate. And you could think of this as a combination of a chemical and a physical etching process. So suppose we have these um, a source of the ions, and the ions are basically bombarding the substrate. So you can imagine that these atoms, when they collide with the substrate underneath it, they can physically knock off the atoms on the surface. So that's the physical component of it. There's also a chemical component of it, Depending on what type of ion you have, depending on what the etching gas is, that can also react with the, uh, uh, with the substrate. Okay. So let's suppose you have a, a, a pretty common uh, a gas, uh, SF, uh, SF6, combined with oxygen. Now, if you were to take this, uh, if you were to take your silicon substrate, and let's say there's an opening here, and you were just to expose it to, uh, um, uh, uh, to the gas. The gas would actually etch the silicon at a, a relatively slow rate, and it would etch it isotropically. You'd get these nice rounded patterns here. 
okay, because it's etching in equally in all directions. When you do the when you use the same gas in an RIE system, which accelerates the the ionized gas towards the substrate, you can actually get directionality. Okay, it's like you're shooting a gun at, at it and you're removing material that way. Okay, so you get much more directional etches because you're combining chemical etching with physical etching. So the next question is how do you actually accelerate these ions and get them to accelerate towards the substrate at high speed? So you use something called an RF plasma. <clears throat> so your sample may be sitting here at the bottom. Uh, and then you have an, uh, below the sample is called a platen. Okay, that's at a positive voltage. And then you have uh, another part of your chamber, which is at a negative voltage. You put a large RF field across, uh, across the two uh, parts, the upper and lower parts of the chamber. Your entire chamber is in vacuum, a relatively low vacuum. You flow a gas in there, and that gas is your etchant gas. Okay, so for silicon, you'd use SF6. The, uh, the, um, the, plasma, the plasma is delivering 100 watts of power, and it's typically at something like 13 megahertz uh, or, or higher. The high electric fields ionize the gas. Right, so you end up getting these negative fluorine ions, negatively charged fluorine ions. Those fluorine ions are accelerated towards the substrate, and those, that's what causes the etching effect. Uh, the specifics of the RF field, if the reason you need a, a radio frequency field is that the oscillating field is going back and forth. So you can imagine molecules would be, or uh, ions, ions would be accelerated towards the substrate and then back the other way. Um, turns out that the smaller molecules, like the electrons, the electrons, uh, will move back and forth quite a bit because they have a lot of mass so they respond very quickly to the field. So the electrons would travel a, a long trajectory kind of like you know the travel the in, uh, entire trajectory and when the electron touches one of the um, uh, touches one of the platens here it actually disappears from the system. It gets absorbed. The larger ions they don't go all the way back and forth like this. They only travel a smaller distance, so they don't get absorbed by the uh, by the electrodes. So you end up having you end up building up a positive charge, and those ions, when they get accelerated towards the substrate, they actually knock off. The, there's a physical uh, etching process that happens when those ions collide with the substrate below it. Okay, so you do need to have this RF field, although it's it's possible to generate these plasmas and do etching with. Um, DC fields as well, but it's, it's not very common, and I'm not too familiar with that, to be honest with you. Um, it, so RF plasmas, these are, you'll find these in any uh, microfabrication uh, facility. Depending on what material is being etched, you have a different etching chemistry. I mentioned for silicon, um, SF6. Um, there are other options here as well. And these are materials for etching polysilicon, aluminum, tungsten. These are some common uh, materials used in semiconductor fabrication. You can see you have silicon, a, a bunch of different metals, uh, some insulating materials, okay, metal oxides, and then nitrides. So this, these are the types of materials that you'd find in a microprocessor. This process of RIE was actually, uh, uh, it was invented uh, largely to work with, or it's been commercialized largely to work um, in the semiconductor industry. There's a version of uh, RIE, reactive ion etching, called deep RIE. And I bring this up because this is, uh, uh, this is one of the most common types of tools that you'll find in any microfabrication facility. Um, as MEMS, as structural uh, uh, engineers, as making MEMS devices, we're often interested in making high aspect ratio devices. So tall and thin structures. Uh, one of the reasons why we do this is it has to do with uh, uh, your homework. It's one, it's, it has to do with one of your homework questions. If you were to make a, um, an array of posts, for example, and you make those array of posts very deep, what's that going to do to your surface area to volume ratio? 
it's going to increase it, right? You have this problem in your homework that has to do with, you know, you, and you have two electrodes. One is just a flat electrode. The other electrode is uh, an electrode that's been coated with, with nanotubes, carbon nanotubes. Basically, just a bunch of towers sticking up off the end. Obviously, the surface area is going to be much larger in the electrode that has these nanotubes sticking off of it, right? So, um, if we were not, if we didn't use nanotubes, if we were, if we were to just make an array of posts, a two-dimensional array of posts on that electrode, then the taller the electrodes were, the more surface area we're going to get. Uh, that's one example. If we just want to increase the surface area ratio, there are a lot of interesting structures that we can make if we can, if we have a way of etching very deep into the substrate. Okay. These types of uh, a basic RIE is not designed to go very deep into the substrate, and wet etching is only designed. It's also not designed to go very deep into the substrate. This uh, anisotropic etching you you can go all the way through the wafer. But the problem is you always get these slanted walls, and that's often undesirable. Right? If we want to drill through the entire wafer, right? so if we want to generate something like what, what's shown in this diagram here, if we want to generate a hole going all the way through the wafer and we have vertical sidewalls, then we use this process called deep RIE. And the ability to make this type of structure is the reason why deep RIE is really so uh, popular today. So deep RIE is a, uh, it alternates etching and passivation steps. It's something called the Bosch process. If you ever work in a clean room, you'll be familiar with this. Uh, it, by alternating these two uh, um, etching and passivation steps, it allows you to get very, um, very tall, you know, it, uh, very tall structures by drilling deep into the silicon. So the first step is called an anisotropic etch. Is this is the RIE step that we saw in the Excuse me. This is the same thing as the RIE step that we saw on the previous slide. You're using SF6 gas co combined with argon, which is just a, um, a relative in inert gas, right? It's a carrier gas, and uh, you use RIE to do a um, to etch into the uh, silicon. Right, SF6 is selective for silicon, but not the polymer. We'll get to that in a second. So imagine that you have a mask here like this. And then you have your SF6 uh, coming in here. Oh, I'm sorry, these are the carbon molecules. Let's get to that later. So you start off with one step. You have your SF6 gas, and you have the RF plasma. So the SF6 uh, drills a little bit down into the silicon. Okay, so you create this first a region, this first etched region. And then what you do is you passivate. Uh, you passivate the sidewalls. So in this diagram, I've showed you that uh, uh, this diagram, you can see that RIE, ideally RIE would always just go straight down. The sidewalls would be completely vertical. But that's not the case. Okay, what actually ends up happening is that you do end up getting a little bit of rounded corners here. Okay, especially if you're trying to drill very deep into the silicon. Okay, this hole will actually start to widen out as you get further and further down. And that's one of the limitations. That's why you can't drill very deep structures using standard RIE. So what you do instead with deep RIE, you, you do this alternation of etching and passivation steps. So first you etched down, you did one RIE step, so you drilled a little bit into the silicon. And then on the sidewalls, you deposit this polymer. All right, and it's, it's sort of like a Teflon-like polymer. A Teflon is like sort of an inert material. So you're coating, you're coating these sidewalls. Right? The way that you do this coating is also in the same, it's in the same tool. It's, it's something called the chemical vapor deposition, which we'll get to in a second. But you put, um, you, you run a gas, a gaseous form of the material that you, the polymer that you want to deposit, and that deposits everywhere in the chamber, on the sidewalls, everywhere. Now this polymer protects the silicon from being etched on the sides. Um, it also protects to some degree on the bottom. However, the fact that you have the RIE process, remember RIE is a, is a combination of chemical and physical etching. So if you were to take this device and you were to just expose it to the SF6 gas on its own, nothing would etch. 
But if you have the SF6 gas under plasma, where the molecules are actually being accelerated in the vertical direction, then what will happen is that this the bottom part of the polymer will be removed. This is because of the physical velocity of the molecule striking the bottom is physically removing the polymer just in these regions. Why doesn't, get re why doesn't it get removed on the sides? Can anyone tell me? Just take a guess. <laughs> Yes, that's right. The, the direction of the the direction of the ions hitting the the uh, the material, right? The the velocity vectors are going down, right? So they're not striking the sidewalls with the force that it's striking the bottom. It's it's literally the kinetic energy of the molecules which is knocking off, uh, knocking off the polymer at the, just at the bottom. Right, so by uh, by alternating the um, the etching steps with the passivation steps, every time every uh, uh, cycle you etch a little bit deeper, and you don't get the because the sidewalls are being covered with the polymer at each step, you don't lose the uh, uh, resolution, meaning um, the etching doesn't go off to the sides like this. You do get this effect called scalloping. You have like a little etched region here, another etched region here, and so on. And this can actually show up on some of the structures that you make using deep RIE. But, you know, that, uh, that scalloping can be uh, controlled. So this is a very uh, um, uh, popular process because you can end up making very uh, um, highly uh, high aspect ratio structures. 20 to 1 is common. You can do even more than that if you have a very good uh, deep RIE process. And using this process, you can also drill through the entire wafer. So this uh, uh, diagram here is just showing the, uh, um, the chemistry of the uh, polymer deposition and also the chemistry of the, uh, of the etching. Uh, these are some examples of structures that you can make. Uh, this structure is, is, a, uh, is all in an, almost a three wafer etch. And you can see that these structures are very tall, very narrow structures. There's no way you could do this using standard wet etching or um, standard RIE. This is an example of a leaf spring that was made using deep RIE. You'll see this in a lot of... Uh, they always use this diagram to illustrate how interesting deep RIE is. Okay. Yeah, question. Uh, so the, uh, the SF6 gas and the passivation gas Oh, the question was, um, are the two gases injected at the same time, or are they injected step by step? It, it's step by step. Yeah, that's a good question. Yes, yeah, so you're alternating the etching and passivation steps. Okay, uh, moving on to uh, glass etching. Uh, what we're working with, uh, you know, we talked about methods to etch silicon. Right now, another very common material for uh, MEMS and BioMEMS devices is glass. So why would we want to use glass? Well, first of all, uh, glass is optically transparent. Right, so whenever we're doing chemical assays, whenever we're doing any type of biological study, we often want to observe the system under a microscope. That's why having a transparent material is much better than having a silicon, you know, uh, an opaque material like silicon. Second thing is glass is obviously readily available. Uh, third thing, uh, for chemistry, it turns out glass is a very good material to do chemistry in. Okay, chemists have used glass beakers for centuries. So <clears throat> the properties, the surface properties of glass are very well understood. Um, there are even methods for like capillary electrophoresis which takes advantage of the surface properties of glass. And glass, for example, has a negative charge on it and you can actually use that negative charge for doing uh, chemical separations. 
So there's a lot of nice properties of glass that, uh, that we often want to work with. So since the 90s, uh, folks have been developing uh, methods to uh, pattern, micro-pattern and nano-pattern uh, glass and, and similar materials. Uh, the two ways that are typically used to etch glass is, uh, number one, you have wet etching, isotropic wet etching, using hydrofluoric acid, and then there's uh, powder blasting here on the right. Uh, these slides are from a company that basically will, if, if you send them a design, they will send you back a glass chip that's been uh, etched with certain structures. It used to be, you know, with microfabrication, even like 10 years ago, it used to be that if you wanted to do microfabrication, you had to do it yourself in your own clean room. But now the industry's kind of like uh, been more commoditized in the sense that, um, you know, if you just want to have a process done, you don't have to have a clean room yourself. You can just ship, 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 ship your design off to uh, a company that will make the devices and, and ship it back for you. It's not dirt cheap yet, but it's, it's not terribly expensive either. Maybe a couple hundred dollars, this company will, will send, you back, um, send you back a chip. And all you have to do is send them a CAD file, say, uh, you know, how big you want your channels, what you want the channel design to be. Uh, isotropic wet etching is often done with hydrofluoric acid, and uh, it's, um, it's a very dangerous chemical, but it, it's, it's relatively economical. Uh, HF, and when I was in grad school, they used to always tell us that, you know, if you, um, if you get exposed to HF, you won't know it. Uh, what, what happens is that uh, the, um, the acid, it goes through your skin, and it goes directly to your bone, and it dissolves your bones. It's a very dangerous material, so you have to be very careful when you're uh, working with it. And they even told us that um, either HF or, I think it was HF, where uh, um, someone was wearing contact lenses in the lab, and the HF actually attacked, it caused the, his contact lens to actually um, attach to his eyeball. <laughs> yeah. just, just the vapors. It wasn't even a liquid exposure. Just the vapors, HF vapors, caused that to happen. So when you're working with materials like this, you have to work in a, in a ventilated fume hood. You have to be very careful with, uh, with them. Nonetheless, um, with HF, it's, t it's wet etching, just like I showed you earlier. You have some sort of mask, and you dip the whole... Um, the mask protects certain areas where you don't want to etch the glass. And the un um, unprotected areas will get etched away. You have to time the etch properly, depending on the depth of the channel that you want. You have an isotropic etch, so th the channels are rounded like this. You can't get rectangular cross-section channels. Now, often you, you want to have rounded channels, and, the, and that's fine. This is the type of uh, uh, cross-section that you're looking for. Uh, and you get nice smooth walls. With wet etching, you do get smooth walls. That's a, a benefit of it. Certain things like electroosmotic flow, it's, it's good to have smooth walls. Uh, this method on the right here is powder blasting. So with powder blasting, you can control the rate and the depth uh, of it uh, by the time and the particle speed. Oh, by the way, the particle powder blasting is literally when you just uh, shoot a stream of sand at the glass. Okay, you ha you still have a mask, so certain regions of the glass wafer are protected, but you're basically just blasting sand particles or very fine particles at it at high velocity. So this is similar to RIE in the sense that it's a physical etching phenomena. The velocity of those of that stream of sand that's that's being shot at the glass wafer is what's removing the glass. Uh, you know, it's removing the glass in areas that are not protected, the unmasked regions. So the rate and depth of the the holes that you can form is controlled by the time and the speed of the particle. Okay, that's intuitive, right? The longer you etch, the deeper you're going to go, and the faster you're, you're, you're blasting those particles at it, the, the, um, the deeper it's going to go. Now, with, uh, with powder blasting, you don't end up with rounded sidewalls. You end up with a 70-degree slope, and you also end up with rough, uh, sort of a rough uh, uh, surfaces. This is, this is very, very smooth. But since you're using powder, form of powder to bla essentially blast the, uh, the glass and, and, and form these and drill out these structures, 
the roughness uh, of the surface has to do with the size of the particles that you're using to uh, do the powder blasting. This is also a relatively uh, you know, economical process, though it's a very uh, dirty process compared to uh, isotropic wet etching. Uh, you can get size accuracy of about 25 micrometers, positional accuracy about, of about 2 micrometers. A little bit better with uh, isotropic wet etching. Again, this is also masked with uh, photoresist. So the difference between the two, if you want to go through the entire wafer, if you want to drill a very deep hole, then often you do powder blasting. Because you can't get very deep with isotropic wet etching. Because this, wet, this etching goes in all different directions, right? So it's an isotropic etching. Powder blasting, by contrast, is anisotropic. So you, you can drill deeper holes uh, without, you know, without having a very wide hole. It's more directional. You can, and you can go through the entire wafer. So this is an example of a glass wafer that was etched all the way through, and you can see the 70 degree uh, sidewalls. We're often interested in uh, making uh, sealed glass microchannels. Uh, so if you want to have a channel, it has to be, you know, it has to be closed on the bottom. It also has to be sealed on the top. This is an example of a process where you can make a sealed glass microchannel. It combines a few different microfabrication processes. But the basic principle is this. Glass can be bonded to another piece of glass at temperatures above the glass transition temperature. So you take, you start off with a, a structure like this, where you have a channel etched through there. You put another piece of glass on top, you heat it up, above the glass transition temperature, which for the material like Pyrex, for example, it's like 600 some degrees. Material softens at temperatures above that, and so you can, um, if you push the materials together, then they'll basically form a fusion bond, which is a quite, it's a very strong bond. So you start off with a, a patterned glass wafer, and you put another flat glass wafer on top of it, and you, you can fusion bond them together. Uh, this is a slightly more complicated process, uh, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. You start off with a glass substrate. Then you deposit an LPC, LPCVD layer of, of polysilicon. We'll talk about CVD in, in a second. And then you deposit photoresist, and you expose it, and uh, you develop it, basically so you get uh, this pattern of, of polysilicon, and you have these small holes in there. Okay, So all these steps here was just to get one layer of polysilicon that has been patterned. First you deposit the polysilicon, deposit photoresist, expose the photoresist, develop the photoresist, and then you use RIE to transfer the photoresist pattern into the polysilicon layer underneath it, and then you remove the photoresist. So all that just to get a, a patterned layer of photoresist. Then what you're doing is you're using the, um, this uh, polysilicon as a mask to do your um, etching with HF. Okay, so this is your HF etch. And then you remove the polysilicon. And so now you're left with just the glass microchannels with an open top. You take another uh, glass slide and you um, uh, press it to it, uh, and fu fusion bonding the two layers together. This happens at about 650 Celsius. Any, any questions about this process? The last statement here? Oh, fusion bonding at the softening point of glass, 650 Celsius. The softening point is called the glass transition temperature. So glass, that, that's the, the glass transition temperature is the temperature at which the glass begins to soften. So metal deposition and liftoff, so uh, e there may be times where we want to uh, deposit a metal layer. At the beginning of class, I showed you how you could use wet etching to um, uh, pattern a metal layer. And we, the example we did was gold. Now, for a lot of metals, there is no chemical etchant or no uh, um, readily available chemical etchant. For example, like platinum, 
there are no, um, there's no inexpensive etching, actually not, not that I know of anyways, that, that will do wet etching of platinum. A lot of times we use tie platinum electrodes in electrochemistry because platinum is, a, is makes a good electrode material. Uh, so, in, in the situations where we're working with materials that don't have a wet etchant and it's not, it's very difficult to do uh, dry etching as well, then you can use a technique called lift off. And this is a very easy process to do. Well, the devil's always in the details, but it's conceptually very easy and this is why it's, it's quite popular. This is called the metal lift off process. The way that you'll do this is first deposit the photoresist pattern. Okay, that's the key difference. We're first depositing the photoresist. In the other uh, case, when we're doing wet etching or dry etching, the standard patterning technique, surface micromachining, we will um, first deposit the metal layer and then deposit the photoresist on top of it. Here what we're doing is we're depositing the photoresist first, then we deposit the metal. Now what that does is that you know the, the, the metal deposits on top of the photoresist in certain areas and then the places where you didn't have any photoresists, um, the metal is going directly to the substrate. Now, when you put this in, uh, when you put this in a developer solution, the developer solution will remove the photoresist. I'm sorry, the stripping solution, photoresist stripping solution. The patterning and developing of the photoresist was done here. So you have a patterned layer of photoresist. You deposit metal on top of everything. Now. Um, when you take this and you put it in a photoresist stripper, the photoresist stripper will remove all the photoresist layer and all the metal sitting on top of it. So you're left with just your metal structures that look like this. So looking at looking at that from the side view, just so just to make this clear here. Uh, let's see. So this is your substrate. You first deposit your photoresist. Okay, let's say we deposited and patterned our photoresist. And then we deposit a metal layer on top of it. So the metal layer deposits in this form. Now, when we put this in, uh, if we put this in a developer solution, so our uh, photoresist uh, stripping solution. The photoresist stripper actually will can attack the photoresist from these two sides. Okay, so essentially the photoresist is going to be removed coming around this way. And uh, when this photoresist is removed, it'll remove the metal layer on top of it. So when you're done with the process, you're just left with um, you're just left with the metal layer like this. In the regions that you didn't have uh, photoresist, where the where the photoresist had been removed. So this is a uh, you're going to have a negative mask for this process. So wherever you wherever you expose the photoresist and developed it, those are the regions where your pattern is going to remain. So if you're doing a lift liftoff step, you have to have a negative mask instead of a positive mask. Uh, this slide also shows that um, uh, uh, this process can actually be used to um, uh, do electrochemical growth or self-assembly also. This photoresist layer that you pattern, so some of the ex substrate is exposed and some of it is not. Uh, you can do other processes other than uh, metal liftoff. You you can do, um, you know, you can use electro electrochemistry to, if you want to grow. For example, we talked about carbon nanotubes. If you want to 
well, actually nanotubes require a different process, but if you want to do um, electrochemical deposition, for example, you can uh, use electro de deposition to uh, grow a bunch of different metals on there. You can use self-assembly processes. Uh, you can even attach a biological molecule. Well, you can attach certain types of chemical molecules if they can withstand the photoresist uh, stripper that's used to uh, do this liftoff process. So then how do we deposit the metals? There's a few different techniques. Um, uh, physical vapor deposition is probably the most common. You know, PVD and sputter uh, coaters are also two different types of systems that you'll see in almost every uh, clean room. So physical vapor deposition can be used to deposit a wide a variety of, of metals and ceramics, uh, including like aluminum, copper, iron, so on. And then these things can be patterned using liftoff. So you can make these very, very small uh, uh, structures. So with a PVD, uh, the target is heated to high temperatures using an electron or ion beam. So a little bit of the physics about this. Um, it's always interesting to know. There you go. So these two diagrams sort of show what's going on here. Okay, in each of these types of devices, you have um, you have a, a target, and then you have the substrate. The target is what is supplying the metal that you want to uh, uh, deposit. All right, the target will let's say it'll it'll just be uh, a crucible. Let's look at this example here. Uh, it'll be a crucible, and there'll be a piece of gold in there. If you want to deposit a film of gold on your wafer. So you'll have a, a gold source here. And these things have become very expensive because gold has gotten very expensive. Uh, it sits in a crucible like this. And uh, in this type of process, uh, you use electron beams to evaporate it. So you have this uh, an electron source. This whole system is under vacuum. The electron source uh, is uh, emits electrons. A magnetic field is used to basically turn around these electrons and, and um, bombard the uh, the source here. When the electrons hit the uh, uh, the target, ions are removed or um, atoms are removed from the target. So if this is gold, then you have like gold atoms basically floating off here after the electrons hit it. So you're freeing the atoms from the uh, uh, the target, and those atoms eventually will deposit themselves on the substrate, which is sitting on the other side of the PVD system. In the case of electron beam evaporation, which is uh, quite common, uh, you use electrons to um, basically heat up and knock off the uh, atoms from the target. And in the case of ion beam evaporation, you use uh, an ion gun, uh, a plasma which generates ions, and then uh, the ion beam uh, is impinged on the target. Uh, same idea, the ion beams will heat up the target, it will cause evaporation of the, uh, of the target into the chamber, and those atoms basically deposit themselves on the substrate. They also deposit themselves everywhere else in the chamber too, fortunately. They don't only deposit on the substrate, they go everywhere. But uh, they form uh, a film on the substrate, and the thickness of this film can be controlled very, very finely because it's a very slow deposition process. Now we're talking like angstroms per minute sometimes. So using this process, you can deposit uh, um, you know, maybe 10 angstroms of a metal film. Right? And you're, you're getting to the point where it's just a, a, you know, a handful of atomic layers thick at that point. So these processes, these are called thin film deposition processes. Uh, these are all done in vacuum, so it requires a good vacuum chamber, 10 to the minus tor. And then a nice feature about these processes is that the substrate remains at um, substrate remains at room temperature. If we're working with uh, uh, like plastics, for example, plastics you can't heat up too much; they'll melt. 
Okay, so when you're working with low temperature substrates, low temperature materials that you're trying to deposit a film of metal on, uh, often we like to use physical vapor deposition because they, um, the substrate remains at room temperature. The downside of physical vapor deposition, which I haven't quite, um, you know, I haven't put this in the notes here, but I should, is that it doesn't have good step coverage. So this diagram that I drew earlier, let's redraw this. So let's say we have the um, a layer here. So this is referred to as a step. This is a metal. And then this is the, um, the photoresist layer. Step, uh, poor step coverage means um, if you have a step, if your surface is not flat, if it has topography, then uh, what will happen is the metal will deposit on the surface here. It will deposit on the surface here. It won't deposit itself on the sidewalls. Okay. Now, for things like liftoff, we don't want the metals to deposit on the sidewalls. So for certain things like liftoff processes, poor step coverage is a good thing. So we want to use evaporation, uh, physical vapor deposition for doing liftoff. But in other cases, we want a, a uniform metal coating that is, um, you know, that also covers the sides here like this. So physical vapor depos deposition does not work very well if you need side uh, sidewall coverage or step coverage. So for those types of situations, we'll uh, prefer to use something called sputtering. So sputter deposition is also used for depositing a wide variety of, of uh, thin film metals, uh, silicon, some other materials as well. Um, there's a wider range of materials uh, compared to evaporation. So conceptually, what's different? Well, what's similar is that it requires a low val vacuum, just like evaporation does. Um, but in, in the difference here is that you're using an RF field to, uh, um, to remove material from the target and to deposit it on the substrate. With physical vapor deposition, we were using, um, we were basically heating up the target and evaporating the the target into the into the uh, chamber. That's why it's called physical vapor deposition or E beam evaporation, ion beam evaporation. It's it's an evaporation process. With sputtering, you have your target and you have your substrate like this. You you put by putting an RF field across here. The basic idea here is that the you create a plasma. That plasma bombards the target and that removes that removes some of the atoms from the target. And then those target atoms deposit themselves on the substrate here. Okay, so instead of evaporation, removing atoms from the target, you're relying on the plasma to do that. So with RF sputtering, you use a 1 to 2 megahertz RF field. Um, there's a lot of information you can find online about sputtering, so um, I think we won't watch this movie right now just for, for timing's sake. Um, but there's a lot of information you can find if you're interested in learning more about it. Uh, the uh, RF field is, is a high voltage field that's, um, that's placed between the target cathode and the substrate. Again, the target is the material that you want. Um, the substrate is the material to be coated and the, the the substrate is a material to be coated. The target is the raw material. So if you want to coat it with gold, there'll be a big piece of gold there. The plasma uh, creates ions. Okay, so you also have to have uh, a small gas flow here. And the plasma ionizes the gas. The gas molecules, so the ions uh, are, uh, you have positively and negatively charged ions. The positively charged ions, which are more massive, they go towards the cathode, uh, and they uh, basically remove atoms from the, the cathode. So these green uh, circles that you see here are, are um, atoms from the target that have been removed 
when these positively charged ions strike the um, uh, strike the cathode. These uh, atoms then uh, go into the chamber. They're they're within this plasma, and they end up depositing themselves on the uh, the the substrate or the anode. Now, the fact that there's a plasma here actually causes the uh, um, uh, causes these atoms to they don't necessarily follow a straight path. Okay, the thing with physical vapor deposition is the um, the atoms are following a linear path. They're following a straight line. So going back to this. The uh, the atoms to be deposited in the case of physical vapor deposition, they're all more or less coming in vertically. And when they come in vertically, that means they deposit here, they deposit at the bottom, but they don't really deposit themselves on the side. With sputtering, the, uh, the direction in which they're coming in, there's some variability in the direction at which these atoms arrive. Some atoms might be coming in this way, so on. Because the atoms are coming in at different directions, they can end up coating the sidewalls like this. Okay, the fact that you have a plasma there is what, what causes that to happen. So you have you basically have more uniform step coverage with, uh, uh, with sputtering versus physical vapor deposition. Now one of the downsides, though, is that the substrate can heat up. The, the ignition of the plasma, plasmas can get quite hot, and so that um, some of that heating is transferred to the substrate. So that can be a downside if you're working with low temperature materials. You have to sort of be very careful. You may uh, sputter for some time and then turn off, turn off the RF field, wait for it to cool down and continue some more. Um, but in those cases, if, if you're okay with uh, poor step coverage, then you would just uh, uh, use physical vapor deposition instead of sputtering. This is an example of a sputtering uh, tool that we have in our uh, clean room here. <clears throat> Should we take a short break? Would you like to continue? Continue? OK. All right. That was one vote. So. All right, so physical vapor deposition and sputter deposition, they're typically used to deposit metals and uh, uh, various uh, thin films. Another method to deposit materials is called chemical vapor deposition. All right, these are the three methods here, evaporation, sputtering, and then chemical vapor deposition. So we're looking at the third one here, CVD. So CVD uses a high temperature gas which decomposes on the surface of the substrate. So uh, how this will work, a typical uh, tool will look something like this. Uh, you put your wafer in the furnace so that your substrate goes in a furnace and it often has to be heated up to a very um, high temperature. So this is, CVD is not a low temperature process. It doesn't work, work very well with things like plastics. Uh, there's a version of CVD called um, plasma enhanced CVD that can work at lower temperatures. Um, we're not talking about that in, uh, in this lecture. You put your wafers inside the furnace. And the furnace is first uh, pumped down to vacuum. So it removes all the uh, uh, ambient gases from the chamber. And then it flows in what's called the process gas. The process gas is very important because the, the process gas will determine what is deposited on the wafer. Uh, a very common uh, CVD process is the oxidation of silicon. 
So this is a chemical reaction. Uh, uh, so suppose you have a silicon substrate and then you flow in water vapor, so H2O in a gas form. All right, this is called wet oxidation. The silicon and the water will react. This forms uh, silicon dioxide and two, um, uh, two hydrogen uh, gas molecules. All right, so essentially what you've done is you've, you've grown a layer of silicon dioxide on, um, on top of your silicon wafer. So say this was your silicon wafer. Um, when you flow this gas over there, you actually end up forming a very uniform film of silicon dioxide uh, on top of it. Now some of that silicon dioxide is actually coming from the silicon itself. The silicon is actually get being consumed in, the, in this chemical reaction. So it's not quite depositing right on top of the wafer, but rather consuming some of the silicon as it reacts with the gas, and it forms a nice uh, layer of silicon dioxide on top. Now, um, it turns out this was very important for semiconductors, because silicon dioxide is a great insulating material, and silicon is a, is a great semiconducting material. To make uh, electrical circuits, you need to have um, if you're making MOSFETs, for example, for those of you who are familiar with MOSFETs, you need to have a very good material for the gate of a MOSFET. Um, so it turns out silicon dioxide is, a, is an excellent gate material for uh, transistors. This is one of the reasons why, uh, um, why microprocessors uh, were able to be made at, with such high density, you know, like uh, millions or, or billions of transistors per chip. So that's an example of one CVD process, but there's there's a whole bunch of different processes which we're not um, going to um, uh, go into. If you're interested in knowing um, what types of materials, I can give you a list of the different materials. But commonly, things like silicon dioxide, silicon nitride, um, some even some types of metals can be deposited by chemical uh, vapor deposition. It's a pretty slow process. It's a high temperature process, but the quality of the films that you that you deposit on there. Is, is very high. A couple of variants of it is low pressure uh, LPCVD. That's the one where the, the chambers pump down to vacuum before the gas starts to flow. Uh, plasma enhanced CVD uh, can be used to enhance the reaction rates. So you can work at lower temperatures and get faster deposition rates. Uh, atomic layer CVD is, is uh, um, used to uh, produce highly crystalline uh, films like epitaxial films used for electronics. So if you want really, really um, uh, uh, precise growth of crystals, if you want your CVD reaction to actually grow uh, single crystal silicon on, on the surface of a wafer, single crystal silicon has some very excellent properties, but it's hard to grow. It has to be controlled. It has to be done in a very controlled process using things like atomic layer uh, CVD uh, or you know different types of epitaxy uh, techniques, which we're not really going to go into in this class, but it's useful for you to know. So we compare the different uh, deposition processes. Yes, we have um, you know, evaporation, sputtering, and CVD. These are for depositing uh, you know, more of the conventional MEMS materials, like different types of metals, ceramics, um, and different types of uh, you know, organometallics, even some insulating compounds. Uh, so this sort of compares it. Uh, one of the advantages of evaporation, like I said, is that it operates at very low temperature. So the substrate is basically kept at room temperature. When you're working with sputtering, uh, depending on what type of uh, sputtering source you have, uh, the temperature will be something like either 100 Celsius or even greater than 300. With CVD processes, you're looking at temperatures of at least 300 with plasma enhanced CVD. Standard CVD, you're looking at temperatures even greater than uh, one, uh, greater than 1,000. So uh, um, there are ways that you can, um, you know, get these uh, get these numbers down a little bit, but they are high temperature, more high temperature processes. Uh, let's see. Um, the deposition rates you can see here, like 0.5 to 5 micrometers per minute. These are very slow deposition rates, so th you're depositing very, very thin films, right? But you can uh, 
you know, you can control the thicknesses of the film very well. So you can get very, very precise uh, dimensions. Uh, most of these are done at um, uh, low, uh, you know, vacuum, uh, vacuum levels, except for uh, paralysis. And some more information about the um, uh, deposition processes here. But just so you see that the main differences between them is the types of materials that you can deposit, the temperature of the substrate while you're processing, and uh, the different types of deposition rates. These next two slides, or next three slides rather, is just a, a few ways to um, where you can see about process integration. Meaning, um, if you combine these d steps of deposition, uh, patterning, and then deposition and patterning again, you can start to make some very interesting three-dimensional devices by using these micro-machining techniques. So this is an example of a micro-machined uh, cantilever. A very uh, interesting device that's used in uh, atomic force uh, microscopy. Have have any of you heard of AFM? <laughs> yeah, you you've heard of it. So you can t uh, you can atomic force microscopy. Yeah. So. Oh, I was just asking, like, you know, what, what, what do you know about the uh, atomic force microscopy? Uh, it's uh, usually used for measuring the Yes, that's correct. It's used for um, measuring the topography of a sample with very, very fine resolution, like a uh, nanometer uh, resolution. I, you know, this might be fun for you, for you all to know just because uh, it's um, the, the device itself is used for AFM. Uh, so let's say um, you have a sample with some sort of topography like this and you want to measure it. Uh, if you image it using light you run into, um, of course you can image it using light. That's You look at it under a microscope and you can see these features. But due to rally diffraction you can only get down to about the, you know, on the order of the wavelength of light. We were talking about that with lithography, right? So if you want to see things at a much higher resolution, one way you can do it is by using atomic force microscopy. Um, take it, basically take a cantilever beam that has a very sharp tip on it. Uh, let's see if I can draw this. Not working well. You take a cantilever beam that has a very sharp tip. Now, when I say very sharp tip, I mean like, um, you know, l uh, less than uh, 10 nanometers. Very, very sharp tip. Uh, uh, you take uh, this tip and you raster scan it across the surface, and you bounce a laser beam. This is actually a laser laser beam, and this goes into um, something called a... Um, Position sensitive photo detector, PSPD. Now, as this uh, as this device is raster scanned across the surface, it's going to the cantilever is going to bend up and down as it goes over the topography of the sample. And when the cantilever bends, the laser light that's reflecting off the cantilever will shift, and that can be detected by this thing called the photosensitive photo detector. So it turns out with this technique, you can detect Angstrom, angstrom changes in, in the z-axis. And uh, the sharpness of the tip determines how, sh how small an object you can see in the x and y uh, axis. It determines lateral resolution. So when we're microfabricating a, uh, a cantilever, the things that we want to do is we would like to have the cantilever beam to have a certain spring constant. Right? So we, it needs to have a certain flexibility associated with it. And the second thing is we need the tip to be extremely sharp because that's what ultimately determines the resolution of the technique. So you can micro-machine, you can use micro-machining techniques to make a, uh, a, an atomic force cantilever beam. Uh, the way you go about doing this is that you first um, uh, deposit 
uh, silicon nitride, and then you etch the silicon nitride with uh, reactive plasma. You're starting off with a silicon wafer. Uh, you define a certain region of silicon nitride, and uh, um, in some of the areas you remove the silicon nitride. So in this case, what's happening is that the entire silicon is covered with silicon nitride, but you remove the silicon nitride in this area by using a, uh, um, a reactive plasma, so plasma etching. So then what you do is you will then, uh, um, you can form the atomic force uh, tip. You deposit some silicon on top of here. That's what you see here. Okay, and then you, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is a layer, um, this is a layer of silicon, and then this is that layer of uh, silicon uh, nitride. This is not correct. The cantilever itself is made out of uh, silicon nitride. Now, when you etch the uh, uh, silicon with HNO, HNO3 and HF, so you're etching the silicon layer away, you do you put a mask on top of there. Okay. Now, uh, this, is, this is interesting how this works. Um, just to clarify, this, the beam, the cantilever beam is made out of silicon nitride. This is, um, this is also silicon nitride just on top here, but that's being used as an etch mask. Now, when you put this into um, HNO3 or HF, which is an isotropic etchant, that's going to etch all the silicon away, and it's also going to start etching the silicon in from the sides like this. It turns out that the way it etches will look like this after some time. If you were to take this cantilever beam and dip it into the etchant for a specific period of time, if you, kept, if you kept it too long, this whole region would disappear. But if you pull it out at just the right time, then you're going to end up getting this feature that looks like a, a very sharp cone. And this cone will be made out of silicon. And it will have a very, very sharp tip on it. What's happening is that the etchant is coming in from the sides, and it's removing some of the silicon here, but we haven't kept it long enough for the etchant to have gone um, all the way through where this entire cone was removed. So this process has to be done carefully, but when it's done properly, you can get a very, very sharp tip sitting on the, uh, on the end there. So you have a, a beam that's made out of silicon nitride, and then you, on top of that you have a, um, uh, a piece of a, a, a silicon pyramid with a very, very sharp tip. It's a, it's a three-mask process. And processes like these are used to um, manufacture AFM probes. When you when you go to uh, Lasker and you you buy an atomic force microscopy probe, these are typically the, some of the typical processes that are used to make them. Uh, the uh, the last step is that you uh, um, in this region around the cantilever beam, you use a step like deep RIE or RIE to basically remove all the silicon underneath there. And now the cantilever is free to bend. So the cantilever is sitting on top of, is overhanging a cavity like this. And in that cavity, uh, that cavity allows the, the beam to bend back and forth when it's being scanned across the surface. These are other examples of structures that you can make with uh, uh, micromachining. These structures get very, uh, these structures show like some of the complexity that you can get uh, by using these surface micromachining processes. By just repeating these steps, deposit pattern, deposit pattern, deposit pattern, you can build up a three-dimensional object layer by layer. The downside is you just need a lot of, you need a lot of processing steps to make these very complex uh, 3D objects. So I think the um, folk mentioned this in his in his book. There are companies. There's a company called Microfabrica that will, if you give them a CAD design, they'll help you. They'll make some of these parts for you, but they're very expensive. They might cost anywhere between ten and one hundred thousand dollars to make a, a single part. Microfabrication processes are always very expensive up front, but when you start making a lot of devices that's when it becomes inexpensive. So it's sort of polarizing. It's very interesting. Like, it makes it hard to do research with micro devices. Making your first device, it's hugely expensive. 
But once you have the process down, then you can make devices for extremely cheap. It's, it's getting over that process that, that gets very difficult. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, we talked about accelerometers one day. Accelerometers, they're in your phone. You know, they, billions of accelerometers are sold per day. In one wafer, in a single silicon wafer, you could get, probably get thousands or tens of thousands of accelerometers. But to make that, the process that the process steps that you have to go through to make that accelerometer, there's you start off with a wafer, and then you probably have to do over a hundred different processing steps to make that make that batch of wafers, batch of devices. Once you've made it, now you have that 10,000 devices, so the cost per device is relatively inexpensive. But there is a high cost to make that, to develop that manufacturing process. So the cost of one device is the same as the cost of 10,000 devices. It's a batch fabrication process. So in terms of when you're mass producing devices, yes, it's, um, it's economical. But if you're just trying to make one device, it's, it's often too expensive. But you can see that with uh, micro-machining techniques, you can make very, very beautiful uh, and complex structures. So we'll, we'll get into some uh, other alternative approaches uh, for doing fabrication if you're trying to do low-volume fabrication, but you want to make the fabrication process less expensive. I think we'll, hopefully we'll be able to finish that today. Yeah, we'll get into micromolding the next day. <clears throat> uh, before we do that, I just want to show one other process here. Uh, this is a, an example of uh, a fabrication on flexible substrates. Just so we're not stuck with this idea that you have to have a rigid substrate to, to build your device on, um, this slide shows that uh, you, can, you can get around that. Now, in a lot of different types of biomedical sensors, you want to be working with, uh, you want to, you want your device to be flexible. For example, in uh, various types of biomedical implants, uh, especially like neural implants, when you implant a rigid electrode into the brain, uh, and that rigid electrode is moving against your body's tissues, which in your body's tissues are very soft, it causes more damage. And when it causes damage to the tissues, the, um, there's a, an inflammatory response that happens where these, uh, I believe they're called uh, uh, glial, glial cells, will, uh, will actually uh, migrate over to the surface of the electrodes. Um, and they'll basically form a sort of a scar tissue around it. And then your electrode stops working. So. Um, to avoid that type of inflammatory response, uh, you have to have a neural probe that is, is, is flexible. It sort of moves with the body tissue. Other examples of where you'd want flexible substrates, if, you, if you're building a wearable device, wearable devices tend to be more comfortable if they, they are flexible and they move with the body. And you've probably seen some examples of um, various sensors that have been incorporated into clothing. Right. Um, that's supposedly a big thing coming up, that you'll have all sorts of sensors embedded into your, into your shirts and gloves and things like that. So for those types of things, they, the sensors have to be inexpensive. They also have to be you know, flexible, so it's not a rigid material built into a, um, a non-rigid uh, piece of clothing. So here's an example of how you can do that with microfabrication processes. Um, you can start off with a rigid substrate, and you can uh, create a thin device and then just separate the two at the end. So let's go through the steps of this process. You start off with a silicon wafer and you spin coat a layer of polyimide on top of it. And polyimide is, uh, is a, a polymer material which is flexible and readily available. It's been around for, for quite a long time. Uh, so what we're doing here is we start off with the rigid substrate. We spin coat this flexible material on top but because the flexible material is sitting on a rigid substrate, it's not going anywhere. It's flat. So at this moment, the polyimide layer is flat. Uh, we can deposit um, a, a, a photoresist layer on it with, with metal here and remove that uh, photoresist layer. So this is basically a liftoff process. So we've patterned some of the, uh, the metal layer here. We can spin coat another layer of polyimide. So this way, 
the metal layers are encapsulated in the polyimide. So now the metal is exposed to air. And then this, uh, this step is an aluminum mask that's used to uh, um, uh, make, uh, make contacts for, uh, for the electrodes. Right, so you have this uh, aluminum mask layer here. You're opening up this region uh, using an, uh, I believe it's, I believe this one is using an RIE etch. So polyimide, the way that you can pattern a polymer material like polyimide is by using um, a dry etch, so RIE, or plasma etch. When you're doing plasma etches or RIE etches, instead of photoresist, sometimes you'll, you'll use a metal mask because a metal mask is more robust than um, a photoresist mask. So that's what's happening here in this step. The aluminum mask here, you're patterning the aluminum mask and you're um, etching through this uh, uh, polyimide layer and that's what you use to make your contacts. So you end up with, uh, you end up with the, having your metal uh, electrodes here. You have these metal lines. In certain regions, the metal lines are encapsulated in the polyimide. All right, so this, in this region, the metals are completely insulated within the polyimide. Just in these regions outside here, um, these metal electrodes are exposed. So you can make an electrical connection into the system. So this is like a flexible cable that could be used in a, um, in a biomedical sensor type device. So you notice that at the end, um, which I didn't mention before, but at the end what you're doing is you can separate the polyimide layer from the silicon. There's a few ways you can do that. One is by, put, by putting a sacrificial layer in between the polyimide layer and the silicon wafer. And when you etch away that, that sacrificial layer, that is, separates the two uh, layers together. So um, I'll, I'll just uh, maybe talk for like t 10 more minutes, and then we'll end for today. Um, so by now, you've seen that these surface micromachining processes, you know, they can be complex. They can be simple. Um, but it, you know, it, using these processes, they're mainly batch fabrication processes, meaning like they're good for making 10,000 devices on a wafer. But a lot of times we want to do rapid prototyping. You know, we have an idea for a biomedical device or a microfluidic device. We want to implement that rapidly and test it to see if the system works. All right? Maybe we're not interested in making 10,000 parts. Maybe we just need one to 10 parts. Um, and also, maybe we need to make our devices much cheaper than what you could do with, with standard microfabrication. So people have looked at different ways that you can do rapid prototyping. Uh, and you guys have heard this recent craze about 3D printing you know, in, in the news, probably, right? <laughs> so the reason why 3D printing is becoming very popular is that the idea is that, OK, I want to build it. I want to make a device. I'll just design it on my computer. and then this printer will essentially print the device, right? So even if the printer takes a, an hour, a couple hours to make the device, it's still, it's a very low cost process, right? And, and I'm getting it right away, rather than having to design a microfabrication process to build it from the ground up and having to send my, um, uh, create different mask designs for every layer that I want to make. And then going to a clean room and having, spending like, you know, thousands of dollars in the clean room trying to make the device. So. With microfluidics and um, biomedical devices, this is especially important because we, we need our devices to be cheap enough to be disposable. And often, my, devices made from standard microfabrication procedures just are not um, are not cheap enough to be disposable. So, just a couple examples here of ways that uh, people have proposed to sort of get around these things. Uh, one is uh, this. Uh, uh, idea that was being explored by, you know, started off in, in Paul Yeager's lab at the University of Washington, and they founded a, a company called uh, Micronics. <clears throat> they were using lasers to uh, uh, cut uh, sheets of plastic. Now, you can imagine if each, um, you know, if you can buy uh, sheets of plastic like transparencies, you know, mylar films and things like that, uh, you can use a, a carbon dioxide, a CO2 laser, you know, wherever you blast the sheet with the laser, 
that material will get thermally ablated, it'll get removed. So by scanning a laser across the surface of a film, you can remove a section of that film. So essentially you're micromachining there. Now if you pattern one film, and then you stack it on top of another film, and you pattern that film, and you stack it upon another film, so you, you have these multiple layers of plastic, and each one is patterned, you can imagine that you can make some three-dimensional, you can, you can make microchannels, you can make sealed microchannels, you can even have multiple layers of microchannels and have things connecting uh, vias, you know, connections between these different layers of microchannels. So this is what you can see here in this diagram. They have some very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, microfluidic devices here. I, I'm not quite sure what this device was, was used for, but it illustrates the fact that you can have multiple uh, channel layers um, sitting on top of one another. You can have interconnections between these different layers, and it's all made on a, this uh, clear um, piece, of, uh, piece of plastic. So an example of uh, a device that they could uh, make with this is a combinatorial uh, micromixer. I guess we'll talk more about mixers um, uh, later. But uh, combinatorial mixing means that I have, um, let's say I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight different inputs here, and I want to combinatorial, combinatorially mix them with 12 different inputs on uh, coming in on this side. Right, so I want to have different concentrations of this chemical mixed with different concentrations of this chemical. Or I want like a one-to-one -one, uh, one -one assay. All right, so uh, this example, um, in a combinatorial micromixer, you have, let's say, four dilutions of this yellow and, and four dilutions of the blue, and you can have 16 possible outputs. Example of where something like this would be used um, just so you have a practical perspective on this. In, in the drug discovery industry, they're off, they often do dosage testing. They're testing a certain drug, um, or they might be testing a combination of two different drugs or three different drugs, and they want to look at, at what concentration of that drug is the drug the most effective. You don't want to go too high because drugs always have side effects. You don't want to go too low because the drug won't have the effect at all. So in a lot of these types of uh, experiments, You'll take, uh, um, you'll do a, what's called a dose response. So this uh, combinatorial micromixer would would do something like that, where you have, um, let's say, two different components A and B, and you can do a dilution of A and dilution of B, and all the possible combinations of all those dilutions of A and B. So if you're doing four dilutions of A, four dilutions of B, then there's the all the combinatorial possibilities. And combining these two, you'd have 16 possible outputs. To make a combinatorial micromixer like this, you actually need to have a um, you need to have multiple channels like this, and they need to exist stacked up in multiple layers. We'll talk more about mixers in, in one of the future modules. Basically, this device is made up of nine layers of mylar, four fluidic layers, uh, four layers of channels, and nine layers of mylar. So you had you know, in between each one of the fluid layers, you had, you know, a seal, a, a plain layer. And you had vias connecting these layers together. So you can make very complex uh, microfluidic devices this way. So another way you can make three-dimensional uh, devices is you can use uh, stereolithography. This paper is also from uh, Albert Folk's group, the, the same author who, who wrote the, the textbook that we're using. Um, this was published just in uh, uh, Labrador Chip in 2014, just uh, last year after I saw this at the uh, conference. And I thought it was quite interesting because it really gets at you know where the field is has come and where it's going. Uh, they're proposing in this paper they were showing that you can do what's called mail order microfluidics. Mail order means you have a design for a microfluidic chip in mind. You just send out the CAD design to a company, and a few days later, they, sh they ship you the microfluidic device. It's, it's a really nice idea because then you don't have to worry about fabrication. The company handles. The company focuses on the fabrication. You focus on the design. 
the, the whole, you know, the whole uh, uh, enthusiasm around 3D printing is also built up around the same idea, right? That you can have a foundry service make that thing for you and just and send you the part. And with 3D printing, actually, you don't even have to do that. You have a printer that's sitting on your desktop. You just give it the design, and it'll make the thing for you. Um, now, the challenges, though, with microfluidics is that we have to often have to make um, we have to make channels of very small dimension. If you buy a commercial desktop 3D printer, the resolution of that printer might be on the range of a millimeter or greater than one millimeter. With microfluidic devices, we're often, sometimes in the millimeter range is fine, but often we're working in dimensions in the hundreds of microns or less. Second thing is 3D printers often are just, they're printing like non-transparent materials. And with some, in certain types of microfluidic devices, we want the thing to be transparent so that we can look at it in a microscope. And they also be, have to be made with biocompatible materials. So there's a lot of issues here, but um, uh, this is some nice progress in this area, really, that, that's showing that it ultimately, like, this, um, you know, spending a lot of time on fabricating devices may be, become a thing of the past. This is a diagram showing um, typical uh, PDMS soft lithography. We'll talk about that more next class. Um, this sort of gets around that whole idea by using stereolithography. We talked about stereolithography last class period, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it other than to mention that you have a resin. The resin is sensitive to light. It cures in the presence of light. It hardens. So if you take a laser and you shine that laser um, into a mirror, and that mirror is, is scanning, it's going back and forth in the XY state, in the XY, and you're basically raster scanning across this resin, you can harden certain sections of it, and then the build platform can actually change the Z dimension. Okay, so you would raster scan one layer, let's say you make this layer here, and then the build platform moves down in the Z dimension, and then you raster scan the next layer. So you can form three-dimensional devices by doing layer-by-layer -layer, uh, optical curing of the resin, basically. So this is really cool because um, you can make very, very complex three-dimensional microfluidic devices. Um, usually we think of microfluidic devices in terms of two dimensions, that you just have channels, a two-dimensional network of channels. Using this technique, you can build up three-dimensional uh, channel networks you can, here you have a bunch of channels that are interconnected by vias here. Uh, you get a really quick turnaround time because uh, these commercial stereolithography systems use lasers and digital micromirrors. Like I said, this is a mail order service. And you can make really complex uh, three-dimensional microfluidic channel structures. You can also make integrated uh, lure connectors. Sometimes it's a pain to actually, if you have a tiny microfluidic chip, to actually make a fluidic connection into the chip. So um, their group, and, and they were showing that you can actually integrate fluidic connectors onto the chip. This might not seem not like much, but when, you're work, when you work with microfluidic devices, you realize that it's, it's a real pain to, to make a good fluidic uh, interconnect. Uh, secondly, they made some of these devices using a material uh, which is uh, colorless. It's, it's sort of transparent. It's also biocompatible and it's, uh, uh, it's swell resistant. It's a material called um, watershed. And is one of the, is a resin material that they used. And they showed that it has um, decent optical clarity. It's not perfect. It's not like glass. It's not like a PDMS, which we'll talk about next class period. But it's, it's okay for certain types of devices, uh, slightly larger devices. Remember, um, uh, this has 100 micron resolution stereolithography. With uh, soft lithography, talk, talk about the next class period, we can get down to um, 50 to 100 nanometers, so a thousand times better than this. But in a lot of cases, a 100 micron channel is fine. And if you don't need perfect optical clarity, um, then this is really a way to go because you can get very, very um, uh, uh, beautiful and complex uh, uh, channel networks. Um, here you actually have a helical microfluidic channel that goes up in a staircase form. You have integrated connectors here. Um, you can really have uh, a very nice um, 
uh, very nice uh, devices that, that do interesting functions. I'll show you an example on the next slide, um, what you can do with three-dimensional channels. So does everyone kind of get the idea here that um, stereolithography can be used to make, um, you know, di directly print um, not just microfluidic devices, but other types of biomass devices. And the path to commercialization here is, is a little bit easier with this type of approach, just because you don't have to go through the whole, um, you don't have to go through many iterations of this molding process, which, which can be uh, time consuming and expensive. So this is the, the last slide I'll show today. I just want to um, just wrap this up so that we can start um, uh, we, we can start on soft lithography next time. Uh, this slide is talking about 3D printed uh, microfluidics. So some of you have heard of this idea of 3D printers. Uh, those of you who haven't, the basic idea is this. Uh, you have a nozzle. And then you have um, a filament of plastic. So this is a plastic filament and it's going into um, uh, a nozzle and this nozzle is heated um, so this particle this filament is fed into the nozzle at a fixed rate and then and the nozzle is heated so you end up basically um, injecting or ejecting rather ejecting molten plastic out of the tip now this is the head and the head is raster scanned back and forth across the surface that you want to print on so the the head basically scans around raster scans in the XY dimension and at the same time the nozzle is feeding out the plastic. The nozzle can be shut off so in some areas there's no plastic being deposited in other areas the nozzle turns on there's plastic being deposited. So basically you can deposit a plastic layer that's patterned then, then the z-axis moves and then you deposit another layer on top of that then you deposit another layer on top of that. So to compare In stereolithography, you're building things up layer by layer by, um, by photopolymerizing a resin. In 3D printing, what you're doing is that the, the nozzle itself is extruding. This is called like additive, additive extrusion. You're extruding the, the plastic material from the nozzle tip, and you're basically building like plastic parts uh, that way. So this, this, is a, this has become quite mainstream now. So it's, it's in the Wall Street Journal. You have a robotic print head and uh, extruder print, printing objects by layering plastic on a surface, very much like a hot glue gun. It really is like a hot glue gun, except it's all robotically controlled. So you give it a three-dimensional CAD file, and it'll build a three-dimensional object for you just by building it layer by layer. So this shows some of the details on how to do that. If you're interested more about this, you can. There's some some nice videos here on this website that show you how 3D printing works, or just just YouTube it. So, um, you know, being that 3D printing was was such a craze, of course, the the folks in the microfluidics community all, uh, said, "Hey, why don't we try to make microfluidic chips out of uh, 3D um, printed devices, 3D printed microfluidic chips?" So, in this type of extrusion um, printing you don't get as nice a resolution as you did from the stereolithography, which we saw on the previous slide. The, they did a study here where they showed the dimensions, the smallest dimensions of the channels that they could make, in this case, were about 800 micrometers, 0.8 millimeters. With stereolithography, you can get down about a factor of 10 better than that, down to 100. And with, uh, with standard um, soft lithography, you can get down a thousand times better than that. So. Get, it's really a trade-off. If you can get away with larger channels, then 3D printed devices is fine. You can also see that it's not quite transparent, but again, the beauty of these devices is that you can build up very complex three-dimensional structures, and in some cases, those three-dimensional structures are actually very, very useful. 
Um, a couple notes here. Uh, they, they can do meltable plastics. Since the, the plastic has to melt in the nozzle, you have to have material that can, that can melt in there. Uh, you get larger features in stereolithography. Now this example, which was just published last month, you know, shows how you can leverage um, the flexible designs that you get out of a 3D printed device. This was published in Nature Scientific Reports last month. I just saw it today, actually. Uh, when you're trying to separate um, particles by size, we'll talk more about this later, um, one way to separate particles by size is by using something called Dean flows. Uh, Dean flows exist when you have um, fluid going through a spiral channel. All right, so what they did here is they created a spiral channel, a three-dimensional spiral channel. It's basically a helix going up like this. Okay? That would be difficult to do in um, a standard a microfluidic device. Right, so they built one that's, in, that's stacked in the vertical direction. The second thing they did, which is also impossible to do in a standard soft lithography thing, is that they have the cross-section of their channel is not a rectangle, but it's a trapezoid. All right, you, you kind of got the idea from our previous slides that you know, when you're doing these surface micromachining processes, the cross-section, if you look at the horizontal cross-section of the device, they'll typically be rectangular. But with 3D printing, you can make whatever cross-section you want. So in this case, the channels actually had a trapezoidal cross-section, and they took advantage of that phenomena because the, what, you form these Dean flows. This is be, the Dean flows form because you have a helix-shaped channel. But this concentration of large particles on one side and the smaller particles on the other side is enhanced by the fact that you have a, um, a trapezoidal cross-section rather than a rectangular cross-section. So we're not going to get into the physics of all that now. We'll talk about that later uh, in, in the microfluidics module. But I just want to illustrate that you know, the fact that you can get these very unique designs, non-standard, non-rectangular, non-2D extruded designs that you can get true three-dimensional structures, and people are starting to actually take advantage of that in, in, in uh, various types of uh, biomaps devices. Okay. And of course, like, you know, it's also very cheap to print. You know, once you have a 3D printer, um, then, you know, printing something like this, you just give it a CAD design, and it's printed for you in uh, a couple hours. Very easy to you know, do rapid prototyping. Uh, you know, batch microfabrication, even soft lithography will take um, you know half a day to a day at least. And if you're talking about standard surface micromachining, that would take you several, maybe uh, a day or more to do. So uh, anyway, so this is the end of of this part of it. So we've talked about ways that we can. Uh, we can do surface micromachining, and then we ended up talking about 3D printing and uh, some non-standard techniques. To, um, next time, we'll start off with a comparison of uh, polymers and glass, and we'll get into different methods of uh, uh, patterning polymer materials. We, we saw a couple examples today with the 3D printing and the stereolithography. We'll get into more examples of working with plastics, because plastics really are... Um, I'd say, you know, for commercial devices, it's more of a material of choice for uh, biomaps devices, more so than silicon and, you know, these more traditional materials that are used in semiconductors. Okay, so let's end there for today. And I'll see you all on uh, Wednesday. If you have any questions on the homework, um, let me know and, and get a start on it.